Working It Out, a podcast show about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplaces, our communities, and our lives. A show where we put diversity and inclusion to work. Got problems on the job. We're working it out. With that workplace got you stressing. We're working it out. With that yeah, we're working it out. Working it out. Working it out. Welcome to Working It Out. I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver. Today we'll be engaging in a two part series focused on the mental health of people as parents and as employees. On this episode of Working It Out, joining me today is Dr. Kanika Bell. She is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Clark Atlanta University. And she's also a licensed clinical psychologist in Atlanta. Dr. Bell is the co-owner of ATL Psychotherapy and Consulting Services, which is a mental health practice focusing on working with the assessment and therapeutic needs of communities of color. Her primary clinical and research areas concern African-American women and their search for identity and psychological well-being. Dr. Bell, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you. Well, Dr. Dr. Bell, as you know, I'm also a clinical psychologist, and these are some really interesting times. It is every day on the news or on uh, various talk show programs, they're talking about mental health, particularly mental health in this COVID uh, uh, pandemic situation that we're coming out of, but are still in. And so times have truly changed because before, as you know, people didn't even want to use the term mental health or psychological trauma or whatever. And now there's a heightened sense and awareness of this, of the importance of this topic and the need for uh, workplaces and families and individuals to address it. Has that been your, is that your take on it? That is absolutely my take on it. And it, my overall take is it's about time. Um, I certainly feel like um, mental health has been an issue in the workplace, in schools, in society uh, for years and years and years. And just now recently, it is starting to get some of the centrality in terms of our discussions about overall health um, that it should have gotten, I think, this entire time. And what do you see as the impetus of that? Why? Why now? So I think there were two things happening, right? Certainly we had the COVID pandemic and it was more than just a virus that happened. It was a necessary and instant behavior change. It was also a trauma that we experienced collectively, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about experiencing traumas, normally it is one person going through something or one group yes. of people going through something, but we all faced that trauma together. We literally switched to having meetings on Zoom because we thought our breath was going to kill each other. I mean, that is more than a, a notion. There were families that did not see each other over holidays, that had never spent that kind of time apart. And so we were all facing that at one time. And then we kind of had civil rights 2.0 happen in the middle of our collective trauma as we're dealing with the pandemic. And we start to recognize, you know, kind of the endemic, um, the epidemic um, of racial trauma that had been existing in communities of colors simultaneously, right? And so I just think we had time to stop and think about it. In the middle of our rat race and kind of running from place to place, we had time, you know, being in the pandemic to stop and say, gosh, there's a lot of things going on. We might want to take some time out for mental health. Well, I've spoken to so many people and there is clearly a shortage of mental health professionals to meet this kind of this, this demand that has been created. But I'm curious, and I want to ask you before we start talking about some of the dynamics of mental health and how it shows up in the workplace. I'm just curious, why do you have a practice that's focused on addressing the needs of communities of color? Well, one, I am in Southwest Atlanta, which is a community of color. And of course we see everybody, right? But it is a collection of therapists at my practice, um, predominantly African-American, but also Latino. We also have an East Asian um, um, person on staff. Um, we are specifically there for people 
who have felt marginalized or distanced um, or unable to access that kind of health care previously. We, we specifically exist so those, play, those people have a place to go. So of course, we're open to everybody. Everybody can come to ATL Psychotherapy and Consulting Services. But there are particular needs of people who exist at the intersections of oppression. Right. And my, my personal research is on black women. I teach a class on black women. I have a book about black women's mental health. And I am there are particular needs that that need to be addressed in certain communities. First generation immigrant um, you know, communities. There's there are particular needs outside of just what's in our textbooks, what teaches us, mm -hmm. you know, about how to work with clients of these communities of colors of color. And that's why you know, we decided, you know, at ATL, we would be a place for people to go where they felt heard, understood, um, and that people were trained specifically in how to work with them in their particular needs. Well, uh, let me ask you, because I'm just curious, can you share with us a couple of those particular needs and how they show up in the workplace? So here's an example, right? So um, th this, this happened actually here uh, in Atlanta. There when, when it was time for some people to go back into the building, right? And, 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 and the pandemic was still going on. Many students were out of school. There, there was a difference here in Fulton County between what South Fulton parents kind of mm -hmm. wanted to happen. There were South Fulton parents like, let's leave the kids out of school. This pandemic is dangerous. North Fulton parents were like, let's put all the kids back in school, no mask at all, right? This is all in the same school district. This is all in the same county, right? And so we have teachers that are going and teaching in particular areas who fundamentally believe I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure I'm safe, right? I'm not sure I'm safe in terms of the virus itself. I'm not sure I'm safe in terms of ideologically what I think about it, right? Like I have a client that went into a school building um, and received verbal harassment from her students and other teachers for wearing her mask. Mm. Right, just for wearing it, because again, it was kind of believed wearing the mask was some sort of demonstration of a particular political ideology, which was not supported at, at her school. So she had to not just go to work, she had to go to work um, and kind of cope with what that was. She was the only black woman also in the building. Oh right? my goodness. So and she so so she, had, she was feeling even further isolated. COVID already isolated us. Now this this uh, political dynamic was isolating her. Absolutely. Oh my god. I goodness. think when people, you know, and this is especially true for people of, of you know, with, with collectivist, you know, ethnicities, when things happen, there's a healing that has to occur. When things happened, whether we're talking about the summer of 2020, the summer of 2015 was very similar, where just a, a rash of viral videos um, made their appearance kind of lasting into to 2016. And when people experience those things, it they need a moment, right? Yeah. They need a moment. There was a tweet that became viral where um, a black woman treated, she said, uh, tweeted, after what happened with the Breonna Taylor verdict today, black women need a minute. Right, I did. We need a moment. <laughs> you know, there's a concept called calling out black, right? Calling mm -hmm. in black, like instead of calling in sick. I am calling in today because the racial trauma that I've experienced after watching the news for a couple of days has wounded me in a way, and that is a particular experience. Right, well, you it's know, a particular experience. I can really relate to what you're saying because uh, one of our clients in our consulting business, Alignment Strategies, and and they were frontline employees that had to go out and you know, work the utility lines and things. And, and some of them, as some of the African-American men felt uncomfortable going out into the communities because of all of the racial unrest. And they felt it was particularly critical that they wore t-shirts and hats that identified them as employees of that company because to go out there with a mask on they felt would just jeopardize their safety. So, and, and the organization had to really step back and think about it because the mask was all about their employees being safe, mm -hmm. particularly since they were frontline, they never even thought about the other implications of a black man going up into say another uh, a, a white person's home with a mask on and the repercussions, potential repercussions for him. So, you know, the point you made is just so, so very real and so relevant. Well, let me ask you just shifting a little bit because uh, communities of color are, are having those mental health challenges, but 
also we did some research and we uh, found some data from Silver Cloud that showed that working mothers were also significantly impacted by the uh, pandemic. And many of them, well, 40, 41% of them felt like they were being exceptional uh, employees contributing off the charts to their businesses pre-pandemic. But post-pandemic, only 25% of them said that they felt they were really uh, hitting the mark on their jobs. And many of them didn't feel good about it. And then some other data said that 80% of employed parents, parents felt like they were really uh, being very stressed out and they were particularly concerned about their children's mental health as a result of this pandemic. So you, we had these work, we had these workplaces where we have uh, multicultural people who are impacted pretty significantly, uh, and they're dealing with issues of stress and 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 other mental ill uh, mental illness challenges. But we have women, we have white males. I mean, it's a it's a universe out here of of folks who are really well, I call them oftentimes the walking wounded, who are trying to deal with issues of mental health, and now they're concerned about their children. And, and it was interesting because yesterday I was looking uh, at a program on the news and they said there has been a 129% increase in, in teenagers who are self-injuring themselves mm -hmm. uh, since this pandemic. 129% increase in teenagers, young folks who are injuring themselves because of the kind of mental challenges they've been facing coming out of this COVID they're pandemic. They're spending more time in, in isolation and mm -hmm. they're spending more time online. And, you know, so there's a couple of, you know, there's a couple of correlatives there, right? The mm -hmm. more time that a teenager spends on social media online, that also increases possible suicidality, right? So that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that created a situation where all of their inter interaction turned to, turned to social media, right? Because they weren't interacting with each other in school or going to baseball mm -hmm. games and whatever the things that they did, being in plays together, whatever they did um, for that interaction. So that absolutely happened. I myself, I, I, that, that was the first time I felt like I really am experiencing extreme anxiety. I am a college mm -hmm. professor. My students are in the 16th grade. My daughter was in kindergarten. I did not know how to teach her. People People assume that you would know how to teach yeah. someone, right? And they were like, you have a PhD? Yeah. Yes, I don't know how to teach someone how to read. All of my students are 22. They know how to read already. I am teaching higher level concepts. And that was extremely anxiety producing for me. I wondered if I was, you know, going to just make some sort of mistake and then she would not be able um, to get back, you know, on grade level, I, you know, and I am just I'm, I'm ordering things from Amazon. I'm trying to just figure out how do I educate someone at home when I have no training in early education at all. My daughter now is in the second grade and has never been to school, not in this, right? She has no idea what it's like to go to school free, no mask, you know, being close together, sharing a box of crayons with other children. They all have to have their same individual box because of it. Like, you know, and I do think about that. I think about how she, you know, we have a, a family trip planned and I think about how she feels about being in crowds. Like we're not, we can't be in crowds. You know, she doesn't hug. She doesn't, I mean, you know, she's coming up under a different set of rules about how we interact interpersonally. Yeah. You know, and this is a child of two psychologists. Yeah. Um, and I'm definitely, I'm definitely thinking about what that means for her because her development is taking place, you know, in this- At a critical stage. stage of her development right. too. Well, I, I so appreciate you sharing that story because sometimes, you know, people assume that because we're psychologists and have titles of doctor this and doctor that, that this stuff kind of escapes us. But you, you're telling the real truth that it's impacting all of us. So let me ask you, what are workplaces doing about that? Because we often think of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, you know, dealing with issues, obviously, of, 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 of race and gender and that kind of thing. But this is a real diversity issue here because it's parents like you, you know, 70% of folks in the workplace are, have, have families and children. So, so what should workplaces be doing to help parents who have this concern? 
I, a real I was, concern. A real concern, right? So I was contacted by several businesses, right? That was looking like, how do we do this? You know, how do we show empathy? Um, you know, and in the beginning of the pandemic, there were, you know, companies were all over the place. There were places that went into micromanaging, right? If you guys are going to be at home, that means everybody has to log in 24 hours a day, have your camera on, you mm -hmm. know, we're able to stay, stare at you. We, we got to measure your productivity. Um, and I did a lot of talking about how, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, please don't do that to your workers because they are already going through, you know, a challenging time. I remember, you know, just in the beginning, there was out of this, you know, everybody has to be on camera we have to see forced social events you know a lot of times mm -hmm. the managers would say we are going to do a happy hour every friday and i know you can make it because you haven't gone anywhere and you're at home and wow. now they've realized that's probably not the healthiest way to address what has happened here right um, i also think what what a lot of companies are realizing is that they have to put some energy into kind of reanalyzing their data around how their workers work Right, and this is that industrial organizational psychology, right? Um, data mm -hmm. all day, and I think that that camp, you know, we're clinical people, but the I/O folks have been saying for a long time, you you know, you don't have to clock people so hard, you don't have to micromanage yeah. them. There are ways to incentivize, uh, you know, people so that they don't feel, you know, kind of abused for lack of a better term, or just you know, put upon by their superiors, and especially when they're already experiencing kind of a psychological trauma because of what's happening in the macro system. So, you know, you, so I think a number of companies have been looking at what can we do then to address, you know, the particular needs of, of our employees so that we say stay, stay sane through these uncertain times. I'm sorry. Can, can you share with us a couple of examples of what these companies are doing? So what, you know, what, what a couple of companies that reached out to me to do work with managers um, and things like that is, and this is going to sound really basic, um, is to just ask how people are doing. I know that sounds, you know, but especially if someone is, is experiencing kind of what we talked about, you know, at first kind of both both pandemics, right? Someone right. is experiencing what's happening with COVID-19 and then also watching George Floyd and also, you know, experiencing these other things that might be kind of traumatically impacting them. Don't act like that didn't happen. You know, don't just say, well, we're back to work. So we're yeah. just, you know, hey, right. Well, How are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you know, you, you, showing some empathy that I understand yeah. that you're a human being, you're an employee here, but you're a human. And, you know, you said it sounds simple, but that have, that was the secret sauce to those companies that really navigated through this pandemic pretty effectively. And that was asking the best basic questions, how you doing? Uh, teaching our managers to be empathic, you know, taking a moment out to just connect with people because the whole issue of connectivity, as you stated earlier, where people working principally from home got exacerbated, right? It, it became an issue. And so making those simple connections, you know, you call it simple, but it was very, very powerful. And you talked about this whole notion of empathy and we pulled some other data and it showed that 90% of, of employees in this particular study felt that empathy was just critical to their organizations demonstrating to them through this pandemic. And as a way of helping them uh, become more comfortable addressing their mental health challenges. But they said, although 90% of them felt that their employees should do it, most of them, the majority of them, like 96% of them said most of their companies, in fact, weren't engaging in ways like that. And so, so there's clearly this expectation right. that organizations should become more empathic, that mm -hmm. they, should real, they should see the age to human part in their employees, but they're feeling that they were still focused on that bottom line. So, um, so what were some of the actual techniques that they trained uh, for those, those companies that were effective in that? Did they give their employees training, their managers training and how to be more empathic, how to, how to convey that in their communication styles? Yes, and I did some of that training, right? Literally talking about how to collapse emails, that the number of emails sometimes send, you know, when you contact someone over and over again, that, that can add to their anxiety. So if there are, you know, five things you want to say, can you think about that, collect those five things and put it in one email instead of shooting off five emails? 
in mm -hmm. an hour. Okay. Um, and it keeps the person feel, feel, you know, kind of pressure to, to uh, over respond or feel like they're not doing something. Mm -hmm. um, can you move? We talked about, about parents. I myself, there was no way in the world you can sit a small child in front of a computer and say, just virtually learn. That was, that was impossible. Yeah. I was sitting, her desk was next to mine. And I mean, I would just hear her teacher say, you got to go and do this. We've got to get this, which means I have to get it. She's six, you know, so there was no way <laughs> you know, that I could figure that out. And so what, can we move one-on-ones or things that maybe just as a small group of folks that have parents in that, in that group, can that move to later on in the day? Because yeah. they need to be available for the virtual schooling, you know, for their children. Can that be moved to a to a time where they don't have to be available to get on and talk to the English teacher about opening the PDF that now we need to all see? Yeah. Because five year olds don't open PDFs well, yeah. you know. So it was, you know, there were kind of specific things like that. Can we move the calendar? How important are some of these meetings? Are they critical? Are they check-ins? Are some of these things an email or a newsletter um, versus an entire meeting where everybody yeah. must come and appear on camera? And that was a difficult one because that education, you know, I'm, I'm a college professor and that was, that was tricky. Old school college professors are like, these people, these kids need to be on camera. Um, That's why I can see them. <laughs> I realized that, you know, no, you don't, because one, you're the Wendy's drive through working. And thank you that the fact that you are, because you had a job on campus, Campus closed, so you can't work on campus anymore, but you still need to work. So they're in, they're literally at the Wendy's drive through in my class. I don't want you to have to feel like you have to be on camera. And also it's distracting to the other students. So you don't yeah. have to be on camera. You know, but like those are some of the ways that I think that um, the powers that be, whether we're talking about educational organizations, we're talking about nonprofits, we're talking about big business, that you can show, you know, we, we learned we can show that kind of empathy to um, to, to employees. Can we go to a four day work week? It's, it's, it's show, is every day important? Can we get one day where they can take care of some other things? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Can the work mm -hmm. get done in four days? I mean, we're just used to five days, but yeah. is it, do we have to spread it on five days? Can this person change their schedule? Can they do seven to three? Mm -hmm. Can they do, you know what I mean? Just all of those things were the kinds of things that were discussed cool. so that the managers or the supervisors and up um, can convey some some feeling of empathy to the people in their charge. Well, I, I so appreciate you sharing that because as you know, there's been a major, what they call the big, the big resignation. I mean, we are losing what 10 million or plus people have yeah, walked walking away out. from their jobs, mm -hmm. right? And the majority of those are women. So when you were even talking about your story about how you were trying to cope with your daughter and then and, and, and still teach and, and deal with the other demands. You know, many women said this is just too much. And we lost something like 6 million women out of the workforce in the last two years. Literally. 6 million women. Literally. And, and a, a third of them or so are not uh, uh, considering returning back. That's a major hit on family incomes, on the workplace, on, on, on work getting done. So, so when you talked about and gave that uh, example of yourself and also what some of the, the ways you've been working with companies to, to think about, to, to, to like reimagine the workplace in, in different ways, that's just critically important because many people are saying, if I can't have more flexibility uh, in this workplace on my job, then I'm not, I'm out of here. And that power dynamic has changed because I know several of our clients were saying, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna support the hybrid work environment. We're gonna let people work from home. And then the leadership changed their minds for a number of reasons. You know, many of them understandable, but for the work, the person who has now been working at home 18 months to two years, wasn't feeling good about it. And what they found out is that they could not demand that people come back and work full time in their workplaces because when they tried to do it, people just quit or just wouldn't come in. So the whole power dynamic in terms of really what your supervisor can demand has changed. Right. Especially when, especially if you can't prove that the person must come back. That was the tricky part. You know, when I talked to some companies, you know, you're, you're, you've lost your footing. Your selling point 
has been lost if you can't, if, you know, it has been demonstrated that you can do this now virtually. Right. So now your insistence, you know, you, it would be different if you argued, well, you're not, you know, you're not meet, meeting your marks or, you know, there's just some levels that you're not getting to because you're at home. At, you know, if we're looking at the data and it shows otherwise, it's hard then to yeah. convince people. And also that, you know, there's just creative ways to, to make income. I think that Generation Z, I know people, I'm Generation X, right? So people and folks like me, we um, are, are often critiquing the new generation about, you know, how they're just, I don't have any Generation Z clients who have traditional jobs. I'll be very honest with you. They're just mm. like, work. <laughs> and, they're, and they're all well taken care of. I have one that's on Instagram posting pictures of herself, she, you know, doing yoga poses and she's doing fine. I have, wow. um, you know, I mean, there's just, you know, they're like, why would I do this? My, one of my interns is, um, she's getting her, her degree, um, becoming a mental health professional. She was like, I think I'm going to quit my other job. I said, well, why are you doing that? This is just today. This is just today, this morning. She said, because what I drove in one night, it um, driving Uber is more than I make there in a week. Wow. It's math. it's math. I have a client that just during the pandemic, she moved in with her mom to just help out and take care of, you know, things over there. She had a sick relative that was in the home and she's been Airbnb in her apartment. And she was like, why would I, why would I go back to work where I am not, you know, being, being kind of honored. My humanity is not being recognized. I mean, this is a different generation. You know, Generation Z was yeah. Listen, I have boundaries. Oh, and but, I think there's something about that. You know, yeah. I think that's something we can celebrate. Well, you're, <laughs> well, you, you're on to something and, and we're going to have to close it up in a few minutes. But we were reading some research uh, that was done in a, a newspaper in Seattle. And they found out that something like 60 or 70 percent of the people of color did not want to return back to their jobs. Mm -hmm. They did not want to physically go back into the workplace. So there's a lot that we need to kind of uh, unearth and try to better understand. Well, Dr. Kanika Bell, this has been a fabulous conversation. And I know we're probably a little bit over, but you just had so many insights that were important for us to have as part of our conversation today. So I'd like to just ask you to wrap up with one piece of advice that you would give an employer on how to help their employees deal with mental health stresses and traumas that they're experiencing in the workplace? I will say briefly, listen to them. Provide opportunities to really hear them, to allow them to speak because their lived experiences should help you inform your policies. Wow. Again, it might seem simple and obvious, but very, very powerful. Listen. Well, on behalf of our team, our producers, uh, we have our first uh, production from Dr. Melanie uh, Dillette Dukes, who this is her first show she's producing. And the rest of our crew, I want to thank you so much for being part of our show and for you, our viewers and our listeners, for tuning in. So on behalf of Working It Out, I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver. I wish you a safe, productive, and what we call Be Happy Week. Goodbye. Working It Out is brought to you by Alignment Strategies a management consultancy with more than three decades of experience in diversity, equity and inclusion, and organizational development. To learn more, visit alignmentstrategies.com. Got problems on the job, we're working it out. With that workplace got you stressing, we're working it out. With that yeah, we're working it out, working it out, working it out.